Thank you, Craig. And uh, again, I would encourage everybody who wants to know anything about IPCC, you should just read Nipsey. <clears throat> so my purpose here today is rather simple, I would say. It's a bit of a cheat. I won't discuss too much about uh, Nipsey because I want to feature what IPCC is and what we are not. IPCC is essentially anti-science, and then we are just doing our best to follow what science is supposed to tell us to do, which is hypothesis, testing, and you know all this level of evidence that we must bring forth. I, as you know, live very dangerously, so I must declare that uh, all views expressed are strictly my own, and then, oops, where should I click? It's not moving, guys. Oh, that lose the fun. Technical difficulties. I really planned this talk, but uh, how do we move forward? I gotta show my PowerPoint, guys. I apologize for this interruption. No, the next page. Go back, go back. Go back, go back, there's one more. I do want to add that uh, all views are strictly my own and should be yours too. Please move on. Uh, next. Sorry? The click. The click, they took it. Okay, let's move on, let's move on, guys. We've got not much time to waste. John Coleman tried to imagine what uh, Roger Ravel would do, whether he would hang out with Al Gore or hiding, and then or he will come here and uh, celebrate with us and probably receive a prize. I am not worthy of any prize. I'd like to tell you that this prize is for all of us. Again, I'm uncomfortable with prize, so as you can see, I want to imagine what Professor Albert Einstein would say about IPCC. <clears throat> Next. I need to click, though. Is there a way I can control this? So just a contrast. We have the green team, which is the IPCC, with somewhat very strange outlook about future. And then we have our red team. And I do want to emphasize that Professor Robert Carter would change the word about red to pink, and he will explain why. And uh, <clears throat> since we are very low budget uh, people, <laughs> and uh, you can see our sunny disposition. We really work very hard, and kudos go to Fred Singer, Craig Itzel, and Robert Carter, and all this uh, Heartland team, Diane Bass and Sam Koenig for very excellent editing. Next, please. Next. So there is indeed a question already raised by uh, Patrick Moore this morning about the probability statement. Extremely likely, guys. Okay, it's extremely likely that it's hot in this room because you breathe too much uh, CO2 out. So there is a very simple question I'd like to answer, propose an answer for this morning. Can someone explain to me how IPCC put a numeric probability to the statement there is some 95% chance that global warming by man-made CO2 emission is true? which is very likely. So let me give you the answer. Here's the answer. Next. Well, let's see. You have 10 experts. Six of them say they were 50 and 50% sure. So, you know, six times 0.5, you got 0.3. <laughs> Next. So four say that they are 162.5% sure. You got 0.65 from that, so you add 0.3 to 0.65, so I guess you're gonna get 95%. And I thank my good friend, Matt Briggs, if he's watching, for this uh, very informative uh, information. Here's just a look of the sun. Two days after IPCC if you issued the press release for AR5 report, August 21, 2013. Nothing personal. But the sun appeared to be smiling. <clears throat> so I'm going to highlight three problems in IPCC. For some of you may know that I'm on another panel, so let me do a small advertisement next for Science Climate uh, panel and panel seven in the afternoon. I will follow on with two more points, since I don't have much time. The first point will be there's no expert in solar physics in this IPCC report. There is this very dangerous ignorance, which I'll show you why. And then I'll propose the, the third point will be on this story of uh, Bill Livingston and Matt, Matt Pant uh, from the National Solar Observatory in Tucson on their study of solar magnetic field measurements. First one is very obvious. You would think 
I please indulge me, I'm very ignorant. You would think that if you want to talk about the sun and the climate, don't you think that when you write the report, you ought to at least have somebody who knows something about the sun, please? <laughs> so the only so solar expert, even that I'm not too sure, but it's okay. Her name is Blanca Mendoza from Mexico. I just got lucky. I just visited their institute uh, uh, a few months ago. So there's only one. For some of you who want the details, before this final draft, it was actually 29 authors. I don't know how they can add nine more in between all that time, where obviously the report doesn't change much. Obviously, they are collecting a lot of authors just to add credibility. It's clearly not credible if you study the history. Now, I'm going to talk about something that seems so obvious. I apologize in advance that this may really insult your intelligence. I'm very bothered by this promotion of IPCC about this work by the person named Steinhuber et al. The paper is published in uh, some sense, a series of it. From the, the main one is 2009, the next one is 2012, and which will allow IPCC on that particular page number to make that kind of statement about how you know, the CO2 changes is so small. By the way, if you follow the, the great communicator, Reverend Jim Hansen, from NASA, formerly from NASA GIS, who proposed that if you think about the Christmas light for the radiative forcing of CO2, that you see equivalent to two to three Christmas light bulb. I am very sorry that you will have no Christmas light bulb in a story about the sun, if you follow that analogy. This is just to prove to you that IPCC indeed promoted that, uh, the idea of the result from Steinhuber et al., and then they make the, the irradiance plot, okay? It's actually for almost 9,000 years, almost 10,000 years of, uh, of irradiant climate history. It's rather a spectacular result if you ask me if it were to be true, of course. But I will explain to you what the problem is. The first problem is that you know that to try to get information as far back as uh, nine or 10,000 years, you couldn't get it from using telescope because no funding will fund you for 9,000 years to, to measure something. <laughs> The second one is that, so you have to use some archive. So the information of this solar activity plotted here as something called the modulation potential as a function of time, okay, long, 9,000 years long ago and then present is now. So they were able to deduce this from the beryllium-10 that is measured in the ice core. Okay, so the beryllium-10 is supposed to tell you information about how the solar activity varies. There's a lot of details explanation. I think I need not go into it just to make the point that you can get information like that. But the problem is that I would say that information like that is somewhat reasonable, okay? Because there's an interesting uh, understanding of how the beryllium tank can be modulated by the sun's activity. But the problem comes is when they connect that, the, 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 the modulation potential to something what they call TSI, total solar irradiance. And the way they tell you that you can do this is by using a very simple formula. You guys can study this, right? I hope you know some fuzzy math. TSI is equal to 1364.64, I don't know how that precision comes from, plus 0.3 multiplied by something called the BR, which is the radio magnetic field measured from magneto, uh, magnetometer in space for satellites, okay? That we have information like that from 60 something until now. So think about it. You're trying to study what the sun irradiance is doing, but you're measuring something local from the, the radio magnetic field, okay? Let me show you what the details of this relationship, where it came from. So from that, you can easily, you can convert this. Simple formula, done, finish. That's how IPCC conclude that the sun is not important. The amplitude is so small that, you know, you have no Christmas light bulb, guys. It's really very dark. <laughs> but I propose to you, IPCC is selling you some kind of speed pants, as you see in this Chinese kit. So now, the shocking results. Can you believe that the whole enterprise is based on that paper that came from Froelich in 2009, Klaus Froelich, who used the upper part, which is the irradiance measurements. Okay, let's not even challenge that for now, which is the next talk. Then they take the radio magnetic field line uh, information, which is all measured, that's fine. But they say now we're gonna select only during the minima. You can see they line up with the, the green line. And then they have four points, four points. And I was marked that the two points that I marked with the circle is not valid because one of them is almost happening right now and one is in the past that they extrapolate. So, ladies and gentlemen, the relationship is based only on two points. If you have two points, you connect a line between them, I hope you know what the result is gonna be. 
oh, they say it's statistically significant. I'm very, very interested in how that proposition can become so important. It's even worse than that. Can you imagine that? Why does it take a Willie Stone to stand up here to tell you this crap? <laughs> I mean, why don't the IPCC do the work themselves? You know, I really am very bothered. And I want to tell you how crazy this whole thing is. You saw the value, right? You guys saw the value. Okay, that's the plot published in 2009. Ever since then, I've been tracking, of course, uh, sorry, I'm not uh, hunting this guy, but Klaus Froelich has since retired. Frederick Stein, uh, Frederick, uh, Stein Huber, he's already uh, going to work in industry, no more job, running out of money. So now, this Klaus Froelich keep producing different plots. You look in details, of course, my PowerPoint will be made available. Please study all you want and check everything. It's jumping all over the place. I, that's why I call it schizophrenic. If you want a revolution of a correlation, I would suggest you better look at sunlight in California versus people who drown in falling into a bathtub. That's a very high correlation, guys. <laughs> so, a very simple point here. I mean, you can hardly accept very weak result like this based on two point. And then to beat the world with this thing is just amazing. And then I guess, I'm sorry, this is the first time you ever heard this, right? Who ever heard of this before? Strange. So the road is not straight. <laughs> now let me hit on the second point that also bothers me. It bothers me that IPCC, if my friend Willie Sessionbach is in here, is quote my word, right? They suggest that this person, Matt Penn and Bill Livingston, Bill Livingston is a very senior scientist in the National Solar Observatory. They are at Kitt Peak. They have been a very dedicated solar observer, so they've been making a lot of powerful, innovative measurements. And IPCC say that if you extrapolate this, this paper, that they suggest that the sunspot activity will, may disappear by, uh, only by half, they say. Okay, I want to tell you, Bill Livingston have not said that. Bill Livingston and, and Pat, Matt Penn essentially say it will drop to zero. I'm sorry, this is you know, what the facts is. You, they didn't quote them even correctly. You go look at the paper, you won't find these facts. So let me suggest, show you what they are doing. They're actually trying to make a very difficult measurement. This is a view of a sunspot close-up. The outside is the granule, which you can see is a hot bubbling convection. And then inside here, where the flow is inhibited, so it's cool, relatively cooler than the outer region. So they're measuring the magnetic field strength in the dark area called the umbra. Okay? So they've been doing that at this facility in Kitt Peak. It's a nice, nice uh, big telescope, but it's going to be superseded by the advanced solar telescope that is almost $2 billion, and then this one has to close up, and then Bill Livingston will not be able to have the second point, the data point, which is really sad for me. <laughs> I'll show you the data. So they are doing this thing called the Zeeman effect measurements. Actually, it's a lot more sophisticated. This is the old way in which that it was done in the you know, earlier 20th century, where you try to find the spectral line being split by the strength of the magnetic field, so it's the Zeeman effects, okay? where you can measure this thing and then compile the whole information of, of how you do that on the sun. So they do a new and more sensitive measurement in the infrared region, almost 1.6 micron. So for that example, they measure about 3,000 Gauss for this particular Umbra region. So from that information, they were able to measure, they started the point about 1999 or so, so they've been measuring these things. And the magnetic field strength of this Umbra magnetic field has been systematically decreasing. If anybody know anything about the sun, if you study the time series of the sun, it always has this 11-year cycle. But it turns out that in this field strength, it doesn't follow any of that rules. I mean, that's how you learn, guys. If you, learn so, if you know so much of the 11-year sunspot cycle, I think you don't have to learn anything. But you're making a quantitative measurements here. So here's what uh, Matt Penn and Bill Livingston say. They actually extrapolate. You know, at least they honestly tell you where it is. But I can tell you, you can look at it. The idea is that if the magnetic field strength go below 1500, then you will not see any more large sunspot. In fact, very, very small sunspot you will see. So they actually say that the sunspot will go to zero. They didn't say by half, okay? So I apologize. Indeed, that this is a, some kind of a, a, a <coughs> just a shy cat effects. The smile is still there. You have the magnetic field, but they're very weak that you don't have any sunspot. The body is missing, okay? And here's a, a, a graphical rendition that is done by David Archibald, but based on the direct results of Penn and Livingston. Those guys, you know, don't like to make plot like this, but uh, thanks to uh, David Archibald who make it clearer. If you can see that for cycle 24, they do suggest that the amplitude to be lower. 
But 25, they are not saying that it's going by half. They are saying it's going to go to zero. Okay? Here's another way to look at this. I'm almost done. This, this three-minute thing is, is scaring me a bit. Uh, so here's the point. I would say that I have one more thing to show you, though. Gangster science as practiced by the United Nations IPCC AR5 will not prevail. Because even the almighty and super powerful IPCC, by the, with the amount of money they got, of course, does not get to vote on reality. I don't think I can end this. Oh, no voice. Oh, I want to show Larry the cable guy. He's essentially saying that it's ridiculous for all of us to ignore this big ball of fires in the sky. You know, he's trying to say, well, too bad it didn't show, but thank you very much. I should have tested this.